Hello and welcome to Alex's Computer Lab. In this episode we will be doing some more work on the Mac LC2 that you saw in my previous two episodes and there will be a link in the description to those episodes. It's a part of our continuing participation in the Marchintosh event that's going on all this month all over YouTube. So please go take a look and search for the hashtag Marchintosh to see lots of other pretty amazing Mac content. So both Ron and Joe, uh, and that's Joe from Joe's Computer Museum, are the ones sponsoring this event. And uh, they've brought together a ton of folks who are passionate about vintage Macintoshes. So, uh, I am one of those. I've been using Macs since 1984, if I haven't said that. I was lucky enough that uh, when my uh, mother brought home a computer for the first time from work in 1984, it was a Mac 128. Um, she is a retired publisher and she had access to those machines from the very beginning. So I was exposed to 68K Macs all along and came very quickly to love them. Uh, some of my earliest computing memories uh, after my original Commodore 64 were working on those Macs that she brought home from work and then later when I was able to go to work with her. Um, I would go to work with her on the weekends so I would always plead with her to take me so that I could uh, play games on the truly amazing uh, big color Macs that she had uh, as I grew up. So, truly amazing stuff and uh, has shaped a lot of my fascination with computing since then. So let's take a look at this machine again and see what we've got. If you remember in the last episode we recapped the power supply and that did work however uh, after a short time in running uh, the machine failed again and that's again, that's due to the caps on the mainboard here. So we're going to take it apart again and we're going to remove this mainboard and we're going to recap it. So I have a cap kit here. Again, if you remember the, uh, in the first episode, uh, I talked about having gotten a kit of parts from console5.com. Again, great folks. Uh, it's definitely not their fault that I brought the wrong kit. So uh, definitely, uh, definitely talk to them. They've got uh, cap kits for a lot of vintage hardware. It's pretty cool. They have pretty high quality stuff and they ship quickly. So I've been pretty impressed with them so far. Um, so anyway, I have their cap kit. I will be removing a bunch of tantalum. Uh, I'm sorry, I'll be installing a bunch of tantalum capacitors to replace some of these electrolytic capacitors on the board that are known to go bad. I'm looking at the board and... Oh yeah, yeah, right there. Oh, well there's a, there's a problem right there. I don't know how well you can see this, but this little surface mount chip right here just popped right off the board. That is interesting. So I will certainly have to reattach that and there's definitely corrosion on it. The interesting thing is where did it come from? Because again, I don't see a lot of gunky stuff around these caps, but I've got to assume given that they're a bunch of uh, surface, a uh, bunch of surface mount electrolytic capacitors here. Yep, and right down here there's corrosion here too. So we'll have to take a look at both of those chips. Hopefully it's nothing uncorrectable. But uh, certainly this chip U12 coming off can't be anything good. We'll take a look at it and see what exactly the purpose of that chip is and we'll see what we can do to fix it. Let's see here. First thing I'm going to do, as I generally do when things like this, is I'm going to take a quick picture of the, uh, the damaged chip so I can remember its orientation. And note to myself the issues. So the other chip that looks significantly corroded is 70L08, whatever that is. Might be UA10, I'm not 100% sure. I'll have to look and get a motherboard diagram here and see. Yeah, it definitely looks like, looks like C13 has been spilling its guts all over the board. Because I definitely see something there. Well, that's interesting. That's definitely the first time I've uh, seen let, uh, corrosion that wasn't very obvious, but obviously doing significant damage given that that uh, chip came right off the board. Let me get my tweezers out. I'll see if I can give you a better shot at the chip. Yeah. 
So this is the damage chip. I don't know how well you're going to be able to see that. I'll try and put it against the background of the power supply. Maybe fuzzy. I'm not 100% sure. So let's try and do that. See if that'll help. But that is it. And there's definitely damage on the board. In fact, looking at this chip, yeah, I see one of the legs of the chip is still attached to the board. Boy, this is not going to be fun to fix. Damage is not nearly as so bad as I've seen on some other boards, but does not mean it's not real. Um, I don't really see a lot of trace damage or anything like that, but let's see here. So, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to attempt to clean this up. So, I need to find some isopropyl alcohol and some cotton buds and see if I can wipe some of it up. Again, for your reference, this right here where my finger is right on the edge of the frame is where I'm working. I'll move the case a little bit more so you can see a little bit better. So, right there. There's a significant amount of corrosion there. So we'll get my non-conductor brush. Let's see what we can do here. Let's see what we see as far as trace damage here like that. I don't see much in the way of trace damage. It really just looks like uh, it ate the legs off the chip. Yeah, and spraying this stuff down, I see other damage here. So I will go and give this decent scrub. Try not to be too aggressive so I don't knock anything else off the board if it's that heavily damaged because there could well be other stuff. Then we'll go down to this other chip right down here where my finger is. This is significantly affected too. Let's see what we can do with it. What's interesting on this board is that it is clearly not battery damage. Um, so you can see the battery right here. Uh, there is absolutely no evidence whatsoever that there was ever a bad battery in here. So, that is definitely not the issue. Oop. And that, that chip just came off the board too. So yeah, it's definitely eating the legs of these chips. I'll have to see if I can figure out what that chip is. So the printing is on it is very small. So I'm going to guess that it's one of these electrolytics right next to it that has uh, let loose. So we will see what we can do. I make no promises at this point. Um, when you see damage to that level on a board, when the chips start coming loose, Again, some of these larger chips may well have damage under them, and then the processor is right there. And so we, we do not know what we're getting into. It may well be that this board is not easily repairable, which would be a shame, because otherwise it's in pretty good shape. Not that I think anyone's going to cry incredibly if a uh, an LC2 board is written off, because it's not one of the more popular boards. But I don't like uh, writing off any vintage equipment if it's a choice. Doesn't matter how wonderful it was at the time or any such thing, they're all pieces of history and they deserve some attention. So we will definitely take a look at it. We also know that this machine was working partially as you saw in the first two videos, so it makes me think the damage won't be that extensive, but again, enough to eat through the legs of two different chips is significant. two chips right here they're damaged we'll deal with those once we get the caps off so let's look at our cap list um, all of these caps need to be replaced here 
Um, we'll take a look at the others. Let me do this. Let me finish taking the board out of the case here. And uh, we'll see what else we can look at. And we'll check the bottom of the board as well. Oh, well, then you can see another hazard of working on these machines. Tabs are very brittle. Which is not incredibly surprising, I'm sure, to anyone who's worked on these machines before. I'm hoping not all of them break off. Because I would like to be able to snap the motherboard back in when we're done here. That is my hope, but I do have to press these tabs out enough to clear the edges of the board to be able to move it forward. Because that's how this board is uh, held in place. It's actually kind of a nice design for serviceability. If I look at this and think about some of the other machines at the time, it's, it's really not bad. Looks like I need to pull this power connector out of the drive in order to move it forward enough. Maybe the SCSI cable, maybe not. Nope, yep, looks like the SCSI cable is okay. Okay, let's look at the bottom here. So before we go any further, I think what I'll do is I will go ahead and glue back this damaged uh, lock. I don't know if it'll be strong enough or not uh, after we're, we're done, but. It goes right there where my fingers are. I'll move this a little bit further so you can see a little bit better. Right there where my finger does. So I'll go ahead and glue it back on. We'll see how it does. I can beef it up somewhat. I'm not sure if you're familiar with the technique, the folks who are watching here, of uh, baking soda and uh, super glue. Uh, what you can do is you can lay down some super glue. And while it's wet, you can uh, sprinkle some baking soda on it. You don't want to get too much in there, but what you can do is do that repeatedly. You can build up uh, area to repair damaged parts. So it basically builds up a solid piece on top. We also have other options as well for things that we can do. If I cannot get this glue back in satisfactorily, I can drill a hole in the bottom of the case and mount a screw or something like that, a plastic screw through to replace this clip and that clip, the one that broke. Um, so we, all we need to do is have those clips in there so that when you plug a cable into the back of the case here and you press on a connector, it does not force the motherboard out of to move out of its place. Again, the other thing I can do as well is I can put down a blob of hot glue right here in front of the board once I put a board in. And again, that's fully removable. It's hot glue is easily removable. Um, so, again, not the end of the world. But annoying nonetheless. Okay, looks like our, our glue is bonding at least a little bit here, which is good. Put some more down at this end. This is also, you see me laying down layers of super glue. The first layer has bonded a bit. I'm adding some more glue on top of it. And I can't really get in here. I probably should take the metal plate out. Because then I'm just sort of depending on the glue to go down in there on its own due to gravity, which isn't the best way to do this. what I have handy, so that's what we'll be doing. And again, I can always come back later and do a better job if it doesn't serve. Okay, so let's move this chassis out of the way while I let it dry while I work on the motherboard. Again, this may well be entirely a fool's errand, given the, the damage we saw, and again, those chips over there that are just falling off the board. But, we'll see. We'll do the best we can. Okay. So, so those first chips where the damage were are C21 and C22, which are a 10 microfarad 16 volt and a 1 microfarad 50 volt. So we'll see what we have. My gosh, is the writing on these guys tiny? That is normal, of course, for SMD components or surface mount components because they themselves are small. It's good that they write on them at all because, of course, um, if you are buying these for what their normal use would be, i.e. production line work, um, the 
the spool they come on. Um, so they come on a, a big, uh, basically a big what's called a reel. And the reel uh, has tracks on on the edge. You can't really see that, but there are actually tracks on this. They're little pin feeds. If anyone remembers dot matrix printers, little pin feeds on the uh, parts for them to feed through. And that's where they come from. They come from reels so that uh, pick and place machines can choose the parts they want and load them. They basically have what are called feeders that take those surface mount chips and load them in so that uh, usually a vacuum assist head can suck them up and then place them where they go on the PCB as it's being built. Okay, That's all our parts. The method I'm going to use today, uh, I'll try first, is I'm going to try lifting these guys up. Um, normally the method you see folks use for this is to twist the caps off, and that is certainly a reasonable method. I've seen a lot of uh, folks do that with great success, and I certainly am not against that idea, but I would like to actually try is taking one of these surface mount capacitors, and I'll make sure you can see it, like this one right there, um, underneath my left index finger. What I'm going to try and do is I'm going to grab it with my pliers right here and I'm going to apply some new solder on each side and then I'm going to heat it and attempt to pull it off. Uh, if I had my hot air here I would use hot air but I unfortunately do not so we'll make do with what we have. So first thing is we'll put down some flux. Where is my flux? There it is. Okay, I've got some flux. And then we will add some new solder. Okay. Move this a little bit so I can see. Please excuse the top of my head. mount I see was. We'll see how damaged the pads are. They are still there. They're not taking a, a real good uh, tin real quickly. So all I'm going to do now is first I'll make it so it's not too hot. It's not. And I will uh, spray down the board here. Because of course isopropyl alcohol is combustible, especially in a spray can like this. So you don't want to put it down when things are extremely hot. Let's see, I'm doing some damage to the label on the board. Um, of course, isopropyl alcohol dissolves glue, which of course will take the label off. So before I do too much with it, I'm going to take another picture just to make sure that I can read it. Not that, again, I can definitely look up what this board is, so not a huge deal, but the more documentation you can do during the process means you won't have to wonder later, oh, what was that thing again? Nice and clear. Now we won't worry about it. Whatever we do with that is fine. So next thing I'm going to do is, again, I'm going to see if I can actually clean up these pads, because if I can't, Probably not a lot of point. I'm putting too much effort into recapping. And of course I could use these capacitors that I bought on another project. So what I'm going to do is I've laid down some flux now. What I attempt to do is retin the pads now that I've got flux. They are really not taking it well. Again, it's not a great surprise because what is going on is that they were corroded. So what we're going to do is we're going to be a little bit aggressive here. We're going to take our 
very sharp tweezers and attempt to scratch through some of the corrosion here. Let's see if we can get any of it. Because there's definitely metal in there. There's no question about that. The, that first pad is not great. But I can definitely feel the metal on these other pads. It's definitely there. Again, I do not want to take the chance of destroying the pads on the board. This is definitely a time where having 20-year-old uh, eyes again would help. So my 45-year-old eyes are not as good as they once were. Okay, I'm having some success on some of the pads here. I'm just again, I'm just scratching it lightly enough that I can knock off the corrosion. If I can get to the metal underneath, I should be able to apply some heat to it. As long as I don't apply enough heat to actually uh, rip the pads off the board. It should be okay. So that's my biggest concern. Because you can very easily, these surface mount uh, pads are not hard to lift off a board. And again, there's enough damage here that I will take a chance doing that a little bit to try and recover it, because otherwise it just may not be anywhere back from this board. Okay. Try going in there with soldering iron again. Let's see what we can do as far as tinning some of these pads. Good. I tinned one. Got two to take ten. Okay, just two so far. Move my fingernail a little bit because my fingernail is a lot less aggressive than the metal of the. Needle nose pliers, of course. Okay. And there's definitely some nasty stuff on this board. The pads on the right side here are black with corrosion. My advice to you is when you finish doing that, don't uh, chew your fingernails afterwards. <laughs> funny, funny Alex. gotten some of these pads to take some solder. You can see I've got plenty of solder on the tip of my iron. Part of what on the, what's on the board is the remnants of the legs of the chip that was here before. To try a little bit of kook on and see what that does. If that will take some of this off. Give it a second. It smells nice, so at least there's that. Again, not what I would usually consider stock uh, cleaning chemical for PCB, but I tried it with some success in removing the flux, so. Now 
if you can see much through. Actually, it looks like you can see a little bit through this, so it's kind of neat. Let's see if I can give you a view of any of this stuff. Through the magnifier, you can see a little bit of what I'm doing. Okay, let's see. Off nicely. And we'll go to the other side. This way. Definitely off on that side. Let's go back this way. Not sure if I'm getting enough heat on this pad, and again, I'm not going to put much force on this pad. There we go. We got it. It is off. Let's see what we can do. How bad these pads are as far as damage. They actually look perfectly fine. off. Okay, so unfortunately my camera cut out during the final part of that recapping effort, so I'm not 100% sure how much you saw. I guess I will find out when I go to edit, when uh, whenever that happens to be. So I do want to, however, show you the recapped motherboard. Um, you can see it is now installed in the case. And I zoomed in a little bit here. I'm going to pitch up a little bit so you can see a little bit better. So there's the results of our repair. Um, that tab actually did stick, if you can see it there on the left-hand part of the screen. And the motherboard actually looks pretty good, if you ask me. Admittedly, I did the work, so I'm just patting myself on the back. But I'm pretty happy with that. So next thing we do is we power the machine on and see what happens and see if my work actually succeeds. And I'm seriously crossing my fingers. Again, reattaching those two chips, repairing this, the damage was significant. So what we will do is I'm going to put this top back on. As you can see, I've already got the machine hooked up. portable monitor here that I have set up. And I will check and make sure that you can see this, which looks like you cannot. I'll angle the screen a little bit. And I will bring my keyboard in from the side so you can see the at least a little bit of the uh, LEDs. I'll move the camera over. This is, uh, we're all professional here, folks. Okay, so give me a drum roll, please. Da -da 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 it's a terrible drum roll, but it's pretty late. Yay! I just heard a bong. I hope you did. And I hear drive spinning up. Let me pull the screen a little bit forward because I think you have a funky angle. This screen is very handy for troubleshooting, but it's probably not the highest quality screen I have. Now, of course, I've got nasty glare in the bottom of it. Move it back a little bit. Excuse me for all the fiddling here. Trying to deal with the glare, make it so you can see it well, and so can I. So that's at least somewhat acceptable. So the machine is booting up, which is unbelievably thrilling. 
Again, I, I know mostly what I'm doing here, as you can probably tell from watching me work, but still with a repair of that level, I'm pretty happy with the result. Uh, I didn't, of course, have to do any trace repairs, uh, but uh, there was significant, significant corrosion damage on that motherboard, so I'm very happy with the result. How's that for desktop background? It's a little better than we had before. The white didn't look all that great on camera. This machine is not thrillingly fast. Surprise, surprise. So, let's try something out. Let's see if the floppy drive works, because I've not tested it. Oh, well, looks like maybe it does. Let's see if we can get this machine to run one of my favorite games from when I was a child. That is Crystal Quest by Cassidy and Green. It's great this uh, floppy drive works. It makes me quite happy. So we're gonna copy everything over and then we will try and run it. We'll see what happens. I'm stuck with 16 colors because this machine does not have a lot of video RAM. So uh, I'm not sure if, Chris, if Crystal Quest will run 16 colors, but if it doesn't, it will certainly run in black and white. And I can certainly switch to that if it's not going to work. Most Mac games run in either 256 colors or black and white. Okay, seems to have worked. Let's check and see if the drive eject mechanism works. So of course this is a, it's a later drive, so it is a manual inject, but it is a auto eject floppy like all Mac floppies are. Hmm. I would guess the eject motor is not real happy because it, the floppy drive did absolutely nothing when I ejected it. So that will definitely require some attention. And again, Crystal Quest is going to be really terrible if I do not have a mouse pad. Oh, apparently it will run in 16 color mode. Let's give it a shot. My gosh, I am playing one of my favorite games from childhood on this repaired Macintosh LC2. Crystal Quest is a pretty cool Mac game. It's one of the ones that I used to show my... Uh, PC compatriots. As you can see, it is not the easiest thing to play. It's got some really neat side of sound effects, but it's a little hard to play this off at an angle, but still, it's a really fun game. It's basically, what you're doing is, the reason it's called Crystal Quest is your little round ship you see me move around. The objective is to pick up the crystals and uh, not get hit by either run into or be shot by the uh, the baddies and literally they are baddies and there are a whole bunch of other things here like you can see these mines that's what those stars are there if i hit them i will explode then there's a bonus right there two thousand points be darn careful when picking up that And you get time bonuses based on how quickly you can clear the screen, which again, as you can see, I am horribly out of practice. But this is still a seriously fun game. When I was a kid, I played this on my Macintosh SE, which of course, yep, and you can see me hitting a mine there. Which of course was black and white, so I spent a lot of time playing it black and white. Ooh, I get a bonus and an extra man.
cannot unfortunately shoot the mines. I could not remember whether you could or not. There's all kinds of different enemies. So anyway, so you get the idea. So I love this game. I think I'll go die now and uh, finish this up. Uh, let's see. At least got to show you a uh, smart bomb, which is what that little red bomb thing that I picked up is. So let's wait until some folks come out and let's set one off. There we go. There's a smart bomb. Okay, well, thanks for bearing with me this long, and uh, I hope you enjoyed this video. Uh, this has been Alex with Alex's Computer Lab. Uh, please check out the other videos that are posted on YouTube this month for Marchintosh. Again, please go check out Joe's Computer Museum and Ron as well uh, from his channel. Uh, they are doing an amazing job order organizing all this, and I thank them very much for putting it together. So again, thanks everybody for watching, and uh, please like and subscribe if you enjoyed it. So, have a good evening.